How's the most handsome Mexican doing? I'll let you know when I find him. <laughs> is What's- it is it is it wrong to say that? Is it wrong to call you Mexican? No, it's oh. not. Mexican's not supposed to be a derogatory term. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Like if people were like, Chris, you're a European mutt. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. I'm just mostly Italian, but I have a bunch of other shit too. Right. Yeah. Um, I will say that, you know, it's kind of funny, right? So I, I'm not sure if you saw, but like I won, I won that award, right? So Which one? I got not, <clears throat> there's, there's this thing here with it, like the local chamber, right? Um, it's the legacy of leadership awards. And Ooh. and there's there's only four categories. So it's kind of a big fucking deal, right? And, so, and so you got most handsome? I got most handsome Mexican. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> I got 2023 outstanding minority owned business. Fuck yeah. And it's fucking wild because... Well, two things like number one, like it's pretty crazy because like my name's up there with like the big ass companies out here, right? Like huge energy companies and ag and stuff like that. But it's at the same time, it's kind of funny though, because I'm like, like, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of my heritage, but at the same time, I'm I'm American as fuck. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to be like labeled as a minority. Right. Cause I'm like, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm first generation, you know, I mean, I'm born and raised here, you know, so it's kind of weird. But at the same time, what's funny is that here in this community, the minority is the majority. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, ah, whatever, I'll I'll take your trophy and I'll go to the gala and I'll make a speech. Why not? You know? (laughs) Yeah, but but you are up there with those companies, right? You just might not see it as you are. So, you know, regardless of the label, everybody else sees you as doing big things, including myself. And that's another reason why I want to do what I can to help you get your message out. And this platform specifically tends to really help people's social media presence. I don't consider myself like a Milet or Stuman or, you know, Andy platform. But once we get people on here, their personal brands pick up pretty considerably. So everybody sees it. It's just a matter of you seeing it too. Right. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, dude. We're working on that image, man. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's the funny part is that's what, that's, what's been frustrating me right now. And that's where like the, the, uh, like I, I posted that question and I really, you know, I've been fucking with your YouTube because I know how important that shit is. You know what I mean? Like commenting and engaging with it. So I'm just Huge. trying, yeah, I'm just trying to pay it forward and stuff, you know, but I kind of met, you know, but it did mean that question too, though. You know, it's like, you know, I, I'm, I'm now in the rooms with the people that I wanted to be in the rooms with, but which question? Well, when it came to like, um, you know, your the, the latest episode with high high performers, like, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just I got to refresh myself on the question. It was something along the lines of like, you know, you you say be be humble and respectful, which absolutely that's that's my nature. That's that's how I am. But at the same time, I've been kind of feeling like I'm being overlooked or maybe steamrolled because I'm not coming across confident in myself because of the humility. You know what I mean? Sure. That could definitely be because you're a humble person, but you still have to be yourself. You still have to add to the conversation. You still have to intrigue the person. You still have to communicate. You just be yourself. Authentically be yourself. Be a humble man with your heart on your sleeve, but just be yourself. Don't be fake. Don't like put on a persona. Like some of these people, even people that have been on my show, even people I've called friends, like you find out it's all fake. Yeah. You know, people can hide it for six months, a year, especially if they're good here. So just be yourself. You're not getting steamrolled. You're just might not be completely yourself in those settings. I'm not, man. And this, I was talking to Cedric about it. I was like, it's pissing me off because like, number one, it's like, I, I feel like, and, and this is like, maybe I'm getting a little too confident, a little too cocky, but it's like, I'm I'm done. Like, I'm tired of like, being, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one to go kiss everyone's ass anymore. You know what There's I mean? There's no need to. No. So I'm like, I'm past that. And now I see like, I, you know, so I'm, I'm like, fuck that. I'm not doing that shit no more. No, that's fake. But then on the other side, it's like, I'm still not me. You know what I mean? I'm still like in the corner, kind of like, you know, being humble and quiet. And I'm just like, why do I do that shit, man? Why do I keep doing that shit? Why can't I just go by and just be myself? You know, I I am in certain circles, but it's whenever I get around the people who in my mind were like the high performers in our area. Right. And 
you know, it's just one of those things that I just gotta, just gotta snap out of. Well, think about it this way. This is what's happening. Okay. You, it, the pendulum has swung. All right. So you were being like a kiss ass, basically the pendulum's over here. Yeah. Okay. You stopped doing that. Now the pendulum swung. Now you're being quiet. Right. So you have to kind of like find that, that middle ground. Like Maybe. it's, yeah, it's it's cool to like praise someone and be genuine about it, right? Right. right a, absolutely. And, but just carry the conversation on as you normally would. Listen, there's plenty of times where I'm around high level people where I'm not saying anything because there's nothing to be said. But mm -hmm. if there's something to be said, just say it. You don't have to like feel pressure to say something. Just be yourself. Yeah, I I feel like I'm kind of getting there. I'm getting to that center now. Yeah, but it, it was just like it was just kind of like you know when you become aware of it, and I'll be in like my mastermind group, or I'll be wherever, and I'm talking a bunch of shit, and I'm just myself and confident and teaching, and you know. But then I go into that room, and for some reason, I kind of like clam up, and I'm coming out more and more. But it's just been a weird pendulum, you know, in in that circle with those higher high performers, you know. But it's funny because I'm in there, and like the room, my everyone's mentioning my fucking name now. You know what I mean? Because they see me and then this accolade, this award that I'm getting is a big deal in the community server. Everyone's like, fucking Armando, fucking Armando. And I'm just there like, yeah, you know? So it's it's the pendulum, man. You're right. Not everyone's going to love you, dude. Right. Not not everyone's going to love you. I'd say 10%, maybe more, 20% of people fucking hate me, dude. Fucking hate me. <laughs> right? Okay, right. cool. You could fucking hate me. I don't give a shit because your fucking opinion doesn't matter to me. Yeah. And if their opinion doesn't matter to me, they're below me and they're going to always stay there. So let's unpack that for a second. Not everyone's going to love you. All right. So listen, you break into this new group. Maybe you're not completely aligned with all of them because they've peaked out. They've peaked out there. You just got started and you're already there. There's levels well beyond where you and I are at right now. If you remember, I told you when you came out to Connecticut, I said, be careful of who you have around you. Yeah, you I know? do. I remember. Yeah. And you're outgrowing some people. That's good. And you're going to continue to outgrow these people. Even the group that you just got in, you're, you're progressing so quickly that you'll outgrow them quickly. Yeah. It's yeah. seasons. People are seasonal, right? They're just seasonal. You can, it's okay to outgrow people. Yeah. It just really comes down to how you leave off with them. Right. 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 Example. Yep. Example. I haven't publicly announced it yet, but we have our first Clark Initiative class coming up for November 11th, Veterans Day. I'm teaching a class to 150 veterans. It's our first Clark Initiative event. Fuck yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. I we, we like we want to fly people in, like feed them lunch, feed them dinner, put them in overnight, so on and so forth. Teach them all day. I've only reached out to a handful of people to see if they want to sponsor the event. Before I go public, mm -hmm. I'm teaching three topics, how to form an entity, how to form a bank account and a credit card processor. I reached out to my, bu my, my buddy who, who's got a credit card processing yeah. company who also happens to be a veteran. Yeah. Yeah. Figuring it was like a perfect alignment. I've never asked for a thing mm -hmm. in a year of knowing this guy. I've referred him probably a hundred people. Honestly, I've never gotten a referral. Yeah. But I don't keep score. Right. Right. Absolutely. I reached out to him, bro. He's treating me like a fucking schmuck about it. Really? Dude. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I mean, it's bad. It's like derogatory bad. Oh, wow. And, and like you quickly realize how fast you outgrow people, how fast you outgrow people. It's okay to outgrow them. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to treat them like shit after you outgrow them. Are you saying in this example, just to be clear, are you saying that, that he outgrew you or you outgrew him? You outgrew him, right? Yeah. Yeah, right? Yeah, no, dude, very. I would love to be around people that outgrow me. Like, please come into my life. You know what I mean? Please outgrow me. Yeah. Well, like, I. I I want to see it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, the reason I ask is because, yeah. you, said, you know, you got to, even after you outgrow, you still got to treat people decent, right? Mm -hmm. you, you said that he's treating you like a schmuck. So I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with this guy? You know? Yeah. And like, um, and what it comes down to is I could tear this fucking dude apart, man. But like, that's not who I am. Right, right, right. right? Yeah. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So th therefore, the lesson of it's not okay to treat them poorly once you outgrow them. Right. But you get all these different like working examples about growing people and you 
you realize you outgrow them at very inconvenient times. Yeah. 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 So especially someone like you progressing so fast, dude, you're going to outgrow people quick. I'm talking about months. You're going to outgrow people. Right. Months. And it's not a bad thing. You just have to embrace it. It's okay for two people to grow separately. Yeah. Is really what it comes down to. Okay. Yeah, for sure, man. Don't, don't that was put, actually that was actually really good content. Put none of that shit in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it. yeah, dude. That was actually really, really good. Um, you you okay with that? You feel better about it? Yeah, I do. And it, it hasn't been. It, it, it's it's it was just like a, a small like it was the back of the mind thing. So that hasn't been weighing on me or nothing. But I've been seeing that, so it's been pretty funny. Get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Get used to it. And um, Rob Bailey taught me this lesson, actually. This was taught to me July, right after the mastermind that I hosted. I went to Rob Bailey's mastermind. And you know, I asked him, you know, shout out to Rob Bailey. I asked him, I said, Hey, um, hey, dude, listen, you know, like you've been in the personal development industry for like a decade. You've like crushed it. You know, I'm at the, you know, like I'm only a couple of years younger than you, but I'm at the point in my career where you were at about eight, nine years ago. Like you're just exploding. Right? I'm exploding and I'm getting around a lot of people in the personal yeah. development industry. I'm getting around like all these people. And um, I'm really turned off by how fucking fake people are. Yeah. Personal development people, like people that people look up to, whether it's on a low level, a mid level, or a high level. Like I'm climbing up to the high level and I don't like what I see. And he's like, Well, what are you talking about? And like, in comes Dana. Dana Lynn Bailey was like, listening she's like oh i want to hear what this guy has to say and uh and i'm like yo what the fuck dude like people come into my life they like talk a strong game like they want to get on the show they want to collaborate like this that they want to do this they want to do that then as soon as they get what they want they're just gone like there's no reciprocation of anything mm -hmm. and he's like yeah okay so let me tell you a story about my dog who used to bite people <laughs> If you came over to my house and I said, Chris, my dog bites, and then you went and pet my dog and it bit you, would you get upset? And I was like, eh, probably not. It's my fault, right? Because the dog bites. And he goes, yeah, same with everybody that you're going to meet on this journey. They're all going to bite you. There has to be some sort of value exchange because they're all going to be pieces of shit at some point or another. So you have to make sure there's some sort of value exchange there. You have to, they have to be able to give something back and you have to vet that before you just go out of your way and help. Mm -hmm. So to bring it full circle, that dog bites on the example I just used yeah. of the person sponsoring our event, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you're going to run into that too. Yeah. If, if you're not already, but it's a really good lesson to remember that no matter what, people are going to be selfish. And it's very rare to find another like highly advanced, highly tuned, selfless, like hard on the sleeve leader. Those become like really good friends. Yeah. You know what I mean? Everybody else is just kind of at arm's distance because they're just trying to get themselves to the next level. And right. let's, let's be honest, certain groups that we're in are full of them. So being aware of that type of situation could be at your local uh, groups too. Yeah. Just you're aware of it. That dog bites. Okay. Got it. And you just keep it cool. So yeah. if you, if you decide to move on, you just don't act rude in the end and you right. just keep, you just keep doing your thing. That That's what's been the cool thing, man. It's like, I see, I see, I threw a bitch fit because I haven't like talked about it, <laughs> but at the same time, like, real talk like it's what's been really fucking cool I'm, I'm going in there now confident enough to stand back and not feel like i gotta go like run in there and kiss their asses anymore right and and it's funny because in a way it's almost like a strategy i guess you could say because they're now everyone's hearing my fucking name being called but now i'm standing in the back at my, at my own table right because before everyone would flock to try to get a seat at his table but I kind of said, fuck that. I just went and I sat down and I'm at my own place now and I'm cool with that and I'm enjoying that. And uh, but now what's happening is now I'm becoming annoyed by observing the bullshit happening in front of me. You know what I'm saying? And that's where I'm at now. But it's um, but it's because you're aware. 
awareness. And what's what's cool about this conversation, the key thing that you said that really hit right now is the fact that like I still got to, you know, you got to treat everyone good still. You can't just yeah. be an asshole. You know what I mean? No. I, I'm not, but like, you know, I, I think I've been, I've been kind of like letting some bullshit out, you know, like just kind of like, I mean, quit, being, quit being a little fucking bitch. There's, you know? <laughs> there's, a, there's a difference between being rude to someone yeah. and just being straightforward. Right. And, and I think, um, yeah, so I, I think we're good. <laughs> Dude, I, I'll piggyback with one story and then I'm going to, I'm going to ask you about being called the minority and so on and so forth. Right. Um, a couple of months ago, I was speaking at an event and um, I think there, there wasn't very many people. It's like 40 or 50 people or something like that. And uh, I actually just, just posted a picture of this recently on social media. I was like fucking tired of this fake shit that I was seeing all day from the speakers to the people in the crowd. I mean, it's just fucking entry level bullshit is really what it was. And uh, you know what I did? Like everybody was like standing and eating and socializing and like cocktail hour and blah, blah, blah. You know what I did? I went into the barn and got a fucking folding chair and I sat that fucking thing down and I sat down. Everybody was standing during social hour. Yeah. At first I was sitting there all alone and people asked me if I was okay. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I like took my shoes off. I put my feet in the grass. Like I, I was doing pretty good, you know, within 30 minutes, not even everybody migrated over to me mm-hmm. and was talking to me. You know, I actually, I posted a picture on it. It was me sitting in a chair with Seen people yeah. Yeah, standing around me. And I was just like, like, I used to have that mindset that you had, right? It was like almost like, am I worthy to be in this room? You know? And then it's like, yo, I don't even know if I want these people around me type stuff. So it's okay to do your thing and be authentic. It's not okay to be rude. It's not not okay to like big league someone unless they deserve it. But that's a whole nother story. It's not okay to be rude. It's not okay to talk down to someone. It's not okay to be an asshole. It's okay to be yourself and do what you want to do, even if that's different than everybody else, because fundamentally we're leaders and we're going to lead the way. And guess what? Everybody ended up sitting down around me that day, leading the way by sitting. I was tired of standing. I'd been standing all day. You know what I mean? But just remember, just don't be rude. For anybody listening that's in Armando's situation or my situation, I think that's the key, right? Like a Dale Carnegie tactic. Like, right. you know, don't, don't give a dog a bad name is the name of that chapter. Like, I know that book inside and out. I've read that book more than any other book. <laughs> so, you know, let's let's get back on topic here. You know, I really want to ask you a few questions and, uh, you know, hear your explanation on things. You know, when we first started, you mentioned that you had won a really big award locally, which is fantastic among everything else that you're doing, raising a family, growing and scaling a company. Yeah. You're also very invested into your local community. Whenever I see a question posted on social medias regarding how to impact a local community, I tag you. I think you do the best at this out of anybody I know. And this local community just gave you a really big award with a title on it as a minority. Let me ask you something. When I look at you, I just see another dude that is fucking trying to put food on the table for his family, for his team, who is the same age as me, who gets up every day, who gets it done regardless of how he feels, at least most of the time. I see another guy who's intelligent, wears his heart on his sleeve. I don't see you as a minority. Right. I'm I'm sure there are Americans that do. I'm sure some minorities, I'm assuming, are like very embracing of that term. That's cool. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being Mexican American, being technically a minority. What is it like in business? Like, what is it like in California? What is it? So what is it like in business? What is it like in California? And are you treated any different? I don't think so, man. I mean, at least not, I personally haven't experienced anything different or at least I, that I know of. Right. That's good. Our, our community, our, this demographic, you know, uh, Monterey County, you know, the peninsula where we're at central, central coast, California, there's a lot, we're surrounded by ag. So I live in the, what's, what's considered the salad bowl of the United States, right? All your lettuce comes from, from where I'm at. Right. And um, so the minority, I, it's the majority, I guess you could say, right? It's it's like a 60, 70% Hispanic community. So I never really, you know, so I'm 
uh, most of the businesses here, I mean, they're all, they're all minorities. If, if that's what they're saying. You know what I mean? So I never really felt like, um, you know, disenfranchised or, you know, anything like that as when it, when it pertains to business. Right. I know that there's programs out there, like you could get certified as a minority owned business and, you know, qualify for maybe some like, like, some brownie points or something when you're when you're putting in a bid for like government some free handouts yeah and you know <laughs> something, there's, there's something to that but i i've never even asked to take advantage of that or even like went out of my way to apply because i'm like how, how i mean like what kind of certification do i need right. like I'm, I'm brown bro like <laughs> right. that's a, but no i so i never i never really thought about it any other way other than i'm just I'm just an American and I'm just a business owner and, I, and I'm proud of my heritage, man. I'm super proud of, of, of being a Mexican American and yep. Sp- Spanish was my first language and I still speak it with my parents and, you know, I was super traditional, but you know, that's, that's kind of as far as it goes, but it's business. It's, not, you know, it's business, you know, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to hear that. Honestly, like th- think about how much we've progressed as Americans, right? You You haven't dealt with any bullshit. Which is which is fantastic because regardless of where someone's from, their heritage, their culture, they, they shouldn't be ostracized because of it. Right. I'm a white dude. You know what I mean? Like I'm waspy white, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so like we get a little bit of shade, like being a white male at this point in 2023, but I could categorize myself as a hundred percent disabled veteran, right? right? Because I am. However, I don't give a fuck, honestly. You know what I mean? And most dudes that are hundred percent disabled are missing limbs, mm-hmm. you know? So like guys like you and I, we have these labels, but we don't play into it because we're not victims. Exactly. Right. And there's a fine line between being a Mexican American, being a disabled combat wounded veteran, and literally only talking about that yeah. and attracting the attention of it. Right. So I praise you for, that answer. And I'm, I'm happy to hear that you haven't been treated any differently because yeah. honestly, there's no reason, but what I do, you know, what I do want to know is what, like being a Mexican American, like, what does that mean? Like, what does your culture look like specifically living where you are? Yeah. It's, it's kind of, it, so again, it's like, it's all I ever knew. Right. So I never really can, you know, uh, notice anything different i guess like just what i'm used to yeah but but i will say this it, it's kind of funny um it, it, it was a little challenging because i wasn't mexican enough to be with the mexicans and i wasn't american enough to be with the americans right so it's like it's it's it's, its own culture this this chicano mexican american culture out here right oh yeah, so it's kind of like you know it's very similar to like text like texans right tex-mex type of tex-mex thing. Yeah, so there, there's Tex-Mex, then over here were the Chicanos, right? So, you know, I I grew up pretty normal. Like, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have low riders and that kind of vibe, you know, but they're out here, that kind of thing, you know? <laughs> ah, did you wear flannels, like only buttoned at the top? I, I stayed away. I, I wear flannels now, but I keep, you know, like a couple buttons open, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I'm an anomaly though, bro. Like, I go hunting, you know what I mean? I shoot ducks in the face, you know what I mean? Like... Yeah, so, yeah, I, yeah. so I was, I, I didn't really, um, you know, like I grew up traditionally with food and family and respect and hard work and that kind of thing. And it's, that's like, that's the vibe, you know, but like, I wasn't like hitting switches in the streets and, you know, doing that kind of thing. <laughs> Is that like the, the low riders and like the streets and so on and so forth? Is that common of like the Mexican heritage? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you could look at, um, you could look at some like nineties movies and kind of see what, what, how we were portrayed the Mexican Americans in Los Angeles and California, you know, a blood in blood out. <laughs> right. Um, it was like that growing up, you know, there was, a um, there was a lot of gang violence in this community, particularly, you know, and, um, you know, it, it actually motivated me to do well. Cause I didn't want to be, you know, but, but I was in sports and shit, you know what I mean? And so mm-hmm. that, so I stay, I kind of walked up and I had good parents to good upbringing. Mm-hmm. We grew up lower middle class. Right. So all the, all the friends, you know, of the neighborhood, it was, it was pretty rough. Right. Yep. So, so there was all that out here. Um, but through sports and, and good parenting, 
uh, I kept my nose clean, so to speak, right? And just here I am. <laughs> okay, so you walked the straight line, which was in between American and Mexican, yeah. is what it sounds like. Right. And you kind of, kind of like paved your own path. That's yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay, so you led yourself, right? Fundamentally, you're a leader, and you led yourself. That's it. Do you see the connection between what we just talked about and what we talked about prior of leading yourself in these rooms and being where you want to be? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, rather than, you know, yeah. doing what everybody's doing on whatever side, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a that's a pattern for you, which is a trait of a leader. A trait of a leader is someone that forges their own path. And once that become great enough, people will follow. Right. And right. you're in that you're in that stage where people are beginning to really start following you and develop themselves. And yep. maybe we could talk a little bit about that. We could talk about uh, your company. But before we get into the company sort of stuff, you started with leadership with your family. I know you got a bunch of women in your life and you got to provide for them. So tell me about these girls quickly. Yeah. Uh, so I'm super fortunate. Um, so I, my wife, she's, she's my rock and it's only through her that I'm able to do all the stuff that I do because she holds it down, man. And she's, she has a, you know, she's a, she's actually a labor, a labor and delivery nurse herself. So she has a great career wow. and she worked her ass off to, to be in her position. She's a charge nurse and she's, she's a boss and at, at, at work and at home. Right. <laughs> You know, we have two girls together. We've been married for, I think this is year 11 now, 11 years married and been together for 20, you know, um, we were, we got together in high school. Wow. And we have a, we have a 10 year old Sophia and an eight year old Mia. And that's, that's our house, man. I'm surrounded by women. It's just uh, me and my, me and my golden retriever red, you know, <laughs> you, you got another set of balls in your house. I do. I do. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Even it out a little bit. I'm trying to strike a balance, but then they they then fucked around and got a little girl chihuahua now too. So, <laughs> oh, no, does it does it beat the retriever up? Yeah, it does. Yeah, she <laughs> lays on him all day, man. It's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you gotta. So you. So your wife holds it down. She handles it. But you guys have a couple of girls. You know you got to put food on the table. Your girls are beautiful, by the way, and, and so is your wife. Your wife and I have corresponded a little bit on Instagram. I assume I'm going to meet her here shortly. Yeah. She's super awesome, and your girls are beautiful, of course. You know you have to feed them. That's, That's what it comes down to. Absolutely. So, Right. So let's talk about the professional aspect here for a moment in the sense of you're early on in business on your own. However, you've been in business well, I should say you've been working for industry specific businesses, if I'm not mistaken, for about a decade and a half. Correct me if I'm wrong. But when it comes to Soria Contracting Solutions, you specialize in restoration right. or restoration of, of damage to households, if I'm not mistaken. Right, right. So this is your entity, but you've been in the industry for a long period of time. Tell me about maybe the past decade and a half of how you went from running the show for someone else to running the show for yourself, having a team where well, you got like six, seven, eight people that are working for you and having mouths to feed. Like, how are you doing with this? It's going pretty well so far, man. <laughs> it's been a roller coaster for sure. But um, so I started off. You know, and I think I started in 2011, like January of 2011. And um, I started off as a technician and I was a worker, general labor. I had graduated the fire academy. Uh, so I was, I was pursuing a career in the fire service. And uh, that was around well, 2010 when I graduated. So the economy was still hadn't recovered from 2000. I was going to say we were in a recession. Yeah. So there were a lot of layoffs in the municipalities. So I couldn't get a job. And so I needed something. And so I started working for a, a restoration company here locally as a as a laborer. And um, I wanted to, I, I was still pursuing the firefighter thing. So I ended up moving to Texas. Uh, it's just, we decided to go out of state to pursue it out there because I thought, well, California is fucked. So let, let's go see if we could, you know, do it over there. For sure. So we ended up in Houston, in the suburbs of Houston, right outside um, in an area called Sugarland. And um, I got picked up as a paid call firefighter. And so that's like the, you know, kind of getting your foot in the door. But I was also 
newly newlywed like like we just got married and we're like our honeymoon was spent driving from california to texas in, in that move right and shout out uh, to your wife bro yeah so <laughs> so what what happened was this is 2011 2012 when we made the move so i had just gotten the position with the fire service as a paid call firefighter which is like volunteer but you get paid when you go out on calls so i got i had i had that gig i was pretty excited that was going to lead to a full-time position but I didn't know there was no timeline. I was newlywed and my wife, she had just graduated nursing school. So she was waiting for her credentials to transfer over to Texas from California. So she wasn't working yet. And cause I, I was working. So I transferred restoration company from, from California to Texas while doing the firefighter thing. My boss asked me to step up as project manager and go to uh, New, New Jersey to work that hurricane. And um, because- Oh yeah, it did smash us. So because- I, my wife wasn't working. I had to put food on the table. So I left the firefighter gig to take the, the project manager position um, to go, you know, restore homes in New Jersey for that, uh, for that event. And that's how, that's how I broke in and, in, 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 you know, management level. And um, from project manager, I moved up to operations manager uh, for, and our company kept growing. Uh, we were about a, I think at that point when I moved there, the, the company I was working for was about a $2.3 million restoration company. And it, but it, it, it experienced some rapid growth and it got up to about $7 million company and I was growing with it. And um, one of our roles as we, you know, in that franchise, when you get to a certain amount, dollar amount of revenue, when you have enough equipment, you, you become a large loss team. So now we're the ones that are coming in when the smaller franchise, like franchisees get into bigger jobs that they can't handle. We were the big dogs that would come in and, and mentor them through those jobs and basically show them how to how to run the large crews and how to document, how to deal with insurance guys and you know adjusters and brokers and consultants. So that was my job. I was that guy. So I would travel and I would help these smaller franchises throughout, like through these big projects, right? And so essentially I was, I was, so you became the trainer. I was a trainer. Yeah. And, you know, I did that for, for, I think five, six years. And, uh, you know, at, at a certain point you're like, well, <laughs> why aren't I, why aren't I doing it for myself? Right. And so that's where the, that's where the, the drive came that I knew I wanted to open up my own. And, uh, it just happened to be in 2021, we moved, you know, we had moved back to California I was working for that same company for a little bit. Then finally it broke off and went on my own and, and here I am. So it's, it's been a wild ride. <laughs> I have so many comments, but let's, that's amazing. It doesn't surprise me that you were the trainer, right? Cause I've seen you work with humans on a development level and it's just natural. Yeah. Like when you were here in Connecticut for our, for our first masterminds in person, right? Mm -hmm. Every student naturally looked to you for direction. And I knew that was going to be the case yeah. prior. That's why I, I addressed you. I'm like, hey, yeah. be, pre be prepared. But now it makes more sense, right? Regardless of what I thought. So that that's awesome. I respect that. So you made the switch when? What year? And in, in, in what did that first year look like? Be, and, I, and I ask that because a lot of people listening, are in like right at that stage where they want to go do it on their own. Yeah. So maybe you can accent that. Like, what did that transition look like? And that first year look like, what did that transition look like? And what did that first year look like? Because a lot of listeners are in both stages. Right. Yeah. It was, um, it, it was scary. Right. Because I, I, I was making pretty good money, you know, I was making, uh, what is it, like six figures, right? Working for uh, as an operations manager for the company here. And I was with them for about two and a half years uh, in California. So I moved back from Texas in 2018. Hmm. And, um, man, it was, it was, it was nerve wracking, right? Because you have a steady job, you have a steady paycheck, and you're about to risk it all, you know, for, for an adventure, right? For something that's not guaranteed. Like, how do you, how do you make that decision, Right. Um, it's and, pretty fucking easy isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> now, now we look back on it and it's easy oh absolutely man i have no regrets right and mm -hmm. uh 
you know, it, it was funny too, because I also had a bunch of people and I'm sure the listeners could relate to that. You have a bunch of people in your ear, you know, me, I had my parents, right? Like me and my dad, he's my best friend, man. He's, you know, he's, so he's always been my, my confidant. Right. So he's like, what are you doing? You got kids, you got, you know, you got the wife, like you guys are just moving around, you know, like you need stability in your life and you're about to do something that's just going to leave you completely like <laughs> on, on shaky ground. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, uh, the only, we got to the point where, you know, we were, we were done listening to any, anyone else's opinion. And the only opinion that mattered for me was my wife's. Right. And as soon as she gave me her blessing, that was all I needed, man. I was like, all right, cool. You're good with it. Fuck it. Let's go. Right. So I went in, I handed my letter of resignation. I still have a really good relationship with my old employer. Cause you know, we we're here local competitors now, uh, competitors. And I throw air quotes on that because we're buddies and we rent equipment from each other. <laughs> yeah. You guys collaborate. Yeah, yeah, That's how high level people work with each other. They don't compete. They collaborate. That's it, man. And so I went off on my own. And so January of 2021, you know, in the midst of a lockdown and COVID and all that bullshit, well, it was it was good for us because we do we did disinfecting jobs, right? So we were going around, we were the ones spraying all the shit. Like, oh the- yeah, yeah, all that fucking horse shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Hell yeah. So that didn't really affect us. It, it actually provided some work for us in the beginning early on. You know what what really helped us out our first year. So I went on my own. I went back to Texas to pick up a bunch of equipment for my buddy, my, another owner of a franchise who I kept a good relationship with. He sold me a bunch of gear, you know, a bunch of fans and, and dehumidifiers. So I quit my job. I spent one week, maybe one week, like getting a website and doing all that kind of thing, like just office work. And I had that moment where I'm like, oh, shit, like if I don't work, I don't eat. <laughs> right. There's no there's no paycheck coming. So I got a little nervous. Right. But I went to go pick up the equipment. And on my drive back, um, I basically when I came back, I had work waiting for me. Uh, so I went maybe two weeks from when I opened my door to generating income and, and and doing business. And the reason I was able to do that was because of the relationships that I had built while working with that other company. I didn't poach. I didn't steal. But it was just, you know, people, you know, people like me. Right. I always had a good relationship. And when I went off, they went looking for me. And uh, so I was referred work immediately. And um, that went very well. Um, so we did, you know, I think we did like 15 grand our first month and I was stoked, man. That was more money than I ever made as a, as an em- a employee. Um, uh, then you go the straight worst- to the strip club or what? I know I, I was cool, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the worst thing that could have happened. And I say that, uh, almost playfully, but, but it's, it was kind of true. That's probably not the worst thing. The worst thing would have been going, going broke. Um, but maybe the second worst thing that could have happened, happened. And that was that in, in the end of February, because that was January. So mid-February, uh, that was when a uh, uh, ice storm, a uh, polar vortex or whatever it was, it hit Texas. And there were a bunch of pipes break in and it was crazy, right? This was in 2021, like February, March. My buddy calls me and says, hey, I'm overwhelmed with work. Can you come out here? I'll, I'll send you some leads. Just pay me a, a percentage for like a referral fee or finder's fee and, and let's go. It was just me, right? So I, I called one of my buddies that I went to Fire Academy with. I said, what are you doing, man? You want to go to Texas with me? He goes, yeah. So I loaded up a trailer, went out there, and I worked for three weeks. And in those three weeks, we produced uh, over 100 k And I mean, as a new business with no working capital. When I started the business, I had $1,500. That's, that's all I had. I had no working capital, no loans, nothing, right? Risky. <laughs> uh, so we did the we did that you know, the, the, the hundred K plus whatever, I think it was like $113,000 in three weeks. And I say that that was one of the worst things that happened because man, I came back, I bought a boat. <laughs> I bought a boat, started going to the lake and hanging out. And, and I took it, I took the gas or the put off the gas and I became complacent because it was more money, you know, than I made, or it was what I made in a year. I made it in three weeks and I, I was working out of my garage. Right? I didn't have a shop. I didn't have employees. So I would just, you know, I cherry pick work from that point on. So long story long, we, <laughs> we ended up doing about just under 300,000 uh, our first year, but it was in, it was about September, October when I was like, what am I doing, man? I, I know better. I've been doing this shit long enough that I know like I could capitalize on, on the opportunity and, and, and do some real damage here. 
you know? And so that's when I was like, you know, I straightened out. I was like, no, uh, I hired a, a business coach. I hired my first mentor and, um, you know, he gave me a good, a good talking to about complacency <laughs> and uh, called me lazy, you know, and uh, I needed to hear that. Next thing you know, it, man, I signed a lease to my shop. I hired my first employee and we, we, we doubled our business uh, in year two and, uh, and we're doubling it again year three, you know? So it's been, it's just been, um, it has been a rocket ship since then, since that decision to invest in personal development and, uh, and let go of that complacency. Wow. That's a hell of a first year, man. Holy shit. Let me, let me unpack this and tie it back for everybody listening. Okay. So you spent a long period of time as an operations manager in the industry that you're working for, that you're working in. You said something very high level that I really want to break down for a second. You said that you still have a great relationship with the company that you left to build your own company. That's the key. That's what we were talking about earlier in the show. It's okay for two people to grow separately. It's not okay to be rude in the end, all right? No matter how much they piss you off. So you're collaborating with your competition. Me moving into year 16, I probably didn't start collaborating with the competition until right around the decade mark. You did it in the first year. Yeah, That's a really high level comment at a first year of business story. So kudos to you first and foremost. And for anyone listening, that's the key. Businesses that do really, really well. I'm not talking like pay the bills. I'm talking like smash. It's because they collaborate with competitors. Yeah. I collaborate with my competitors. We're friends. Yeah. There's there's plenty of bread on the table. Plenty. Yeah. Plenty. I, I, took Plenty. It, I took it a step further, man. Um, as a matter of fact, you say that, and it's funny because I'm just, you know, it, <laughs> I actually called or messaged and emailed or like through LinkedIn or whatever. I contacted virtually every every restoration company, letting them know, hey, I just want to introduce myself. My name's Armando. I'm opening up shop. You may have heard of me. I used to work here, but I just want to just reach out. If you guys ever need anything. I'm here and vice versa. If I get into something that I can't handle because it's just me, you know, starting out, I'll give you guys a call. And I was actually referring to, uh, to my competitors in year one. Some of them reciprocated. Some of them ignored me. Some of them talk shit, <laughs> right? But I, I reached out to every one of them. And, uh, and I have a good relationship with most of my competitors. And the ones I don't are the ones that just didn't reach back out. That's also high level. And that's because you're such a good person. So to kind of to kind of like circle back and put a piggyback on that and tie it to the listeners, I'm in three different industries. I, I'm in the jewelry industry, I'm in the personal development industry, and I'm in the nonprofit industry. In the jewelry industry, we deal in retail timepieces, right? So let's say uh, someone is looking for a brand that I don't deal with, like maybe an Oris or a Seiko, right? Very low, very low uh, entry. It, it do I know about them? Sure. Could I get them? Definitely. Do I know a guy right down the street who carries both? One hundred percent. So. I'll actually refer that customer over and yeah. give my competitor help. But the client has helped, the competitor has helped, everybody's happy. In the personal development industry, if someone comes to me and says, Chris, can you teach me how to be a father? I'd be like, no, I can't. Right. I have a godson and a niece that I'm responsible for, for the most part, but I'm not their father. Um, however, why don't you talk to so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? I'll make the introduction. In the nonprofit world, we deal with veterans. Veteran, The veteran industry is saturated in nonprofit. But if someone says, Chris, I really need help with my PTSD. I want to kill myself. Hold on a second. Let's get you the proper help. I teach veterans to become entrepreneurs, not how to take the gun out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. So that's the key. The key is having that network, especially if you want to provide financially for a lot of people and live a very nice financial life. It's actually giving your competitors business and collaborate. So that was a really good addition. And I hope that lesson lands really well with anyone listening. Yeah, absolutely. So, so 
All right. So fantastic explanation. If you could, I already know the answer, but if you go back to year one, which wasn't too long ago, and you could change one thing or give yourself one lesson that you know now that you can go back to, go back to Armando when he was a handsome (laughs) mid 30 year old first year business owner, what lesson would you sit yourself down and be like, listen, dude, you need to fucking learn this. Yeah, it it would be, it would be, uh, (laughs) getting involved with, um, with, with, with mentors, you know, coaches. I mean, that was so huge for me. Um, that, and also that's a good one. Yeah, man, that and checking your, your, your circle as well, man. Like Mm -hmm. that was, that was, that was, that would have been huge because I would have just kind of stayed (laughs) focused on, on the shit I needed to do. Right. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that that would be the first thing I would have told myself. Yeah. How powerful is that? You're aware enough to realize that you didn't know enough to ask for help immediately. However, you did figure it out and it worked well for you. That advice your coach gave you was really good advice. I don't know the guy, but it sounds like he knows his shit. And in addition to that, I struggled with the same thing. And the answer that you gave is an answer that I give. You know, 15 years ago, I was fresh out of the military. My ego was this big and it controlled me. I played God Mm. for two years. Like, of course, my ego was going to be involved. It kept me alive. But the point that I'm getting at is I couldn't ask for help. Right. I couldn't. And I couldn't for the better part of a decade. I think it was like year eight or nine, I fired me. I hired my first uh, mentor and business coach. And looking back on things, that's the same lesson that I'd give myself. And let's talk about this for a second, because you and I both coach and mentor people. We're also coached and mentored. Yeah. Are there any things you should watch out for from certain coaches and mentors? Are there any red flags that you've learned of? Absolutely, man. I mean, the I've been I was saying this just the other day. I mean, you, you got to be careful who you listen to, man. You got to vet them. You got to vet your coaches, right? Because everyone's a coach nowadays, <laughs> right? And there's a lot of bullshit out there. And it's like, if I want, if I want you know, coaching and advice from, for, for business, then I need to look at someone that has actually established themselves and is actually killing it in business. Right. Like not everyone's capable. <laughs> so you got, you got to do, like, do your homework, vet them. Now, how would you go about vetting someone? Honestly, check, uh, check their, uh, what is it? The references, right? Check references and, and, and do your research. Right. I mean, uh, I, that's how I tend to find my coaches now is, is I actually, you know, I have a big enough circle that's, that's working, you know, working on personal development, that kind of thing, where I could talk to someone that used that coach and ask about their experiences, how he was, that kind of thing. And then beyond that, just look at their, just look what they built. <laughs> right. Yeah. Check into the person. Right. I mean, I could talk for hours about this subject, but that's, that's really, really, really good advice. Um, yeah, and I've personally invested in coaches and learned with ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars exactly what not to do as a coach by hiring the wrong coach for me. Yeah. I think I'll, I think that if we can go just one step deeper, my opinion is if you're going to hire a coach, be completely content with wanting to trade places with them in life and understand them morally and ethically. A pretty popular key term for morals and ethics would be core values. So look into their core values, their morals, their ethics, how they operate, but look a step further because a lot of them will say certain things and do the other. So it's very tricky, especially with social media. A really really good approach that I liked with one of my coaches and mentors was you had to pay him up front and then fly in to meet him in person. And if he didn't want to work with you, he would refund your money right there and then. And it goes good for both people both ways. But definitely vet the person. Very well said. Excellent advice to go back to two years ago, Armando and business. <laughs> and um, yeah, and 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 that, that resonates with me too, man. What you were saying um, about you know, obviously you have a <laughs> you had a hell of a, a hell of an experience as, in the military, right? Uh, but it was relatable in the sense that when I went into business, I mean, I was I was I was the trainer, right? Uh, in in my franchise system that I worked in, so I, I thought I knew everything, man. So asking for help was was incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, so yeah, it's just ego. Yeah. It's just our egos. All right. Well, let me let me let's close it up with one thing here. Um, if you could give uh, 
one small piece of advice to someone early on in their personal development journey? If you could give that one piece of advice that would potentially change their outlook on what they do or are doing or are going, what piece of advice would that be? That's uh, personal, personal development. Personal development. Yeah, I would encourage them to to check their associations, man. That's that's so huge for me. Like that down right there. Like if, if you're starting out in personal development, that's mm. the first place you should start. Yeah. <laughs> it's not at your circle. Mm. You know, surround yourself with people that are that are gonna elevate you and bring you up. And then from there, everything's gonna start shifting. You're gonna be, you know, that's where your eyes start opening, the awareness starts coming in and that kind of thing. Because if you're surrounding yourself with the same tribe or, or people that you used to be with, you're, you're not, it's going to be incredibly difficult for you to gain that level of awareness. And so audit your circle. Yeah. Yeah. Powerful advice right there. Powerful. Um, one of my first shows from 2018 on my on the CW clinic, the, the, the show here, first five shows is audit your circle. Yeah. 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 Excellent, excellent advice. Well, dude, listen, man, pretty, pretty good conversation here. And when I say pretty, I mean, is very insightful. And thank you for being so open about all aspects of your life and teaching me and, and all of us some very powerful lessons when it comes to culture, ethnicity, uh, networking, relationships, personal development, and and business. I mean, it was a pretty well-rounded conversation. And uh, I just want to say that you did a fantastic job, very well said and articulated. And I know that everyone that listens is going to enjoy this convo. So thank you for your time, brother. Yeah, man. No, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I say we do another one eventually. Let's take a look at Armando a year from now and see the lessons that he's learned in year three to four. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm always down. All right, dude. Well, thank you for your time and uh, catch you later. Yes, sir. Talk soon.